Good evening. Welcome to the second lecture of the online lecture series on language, literature, and cultural studies organized by the English Language Teachers Interaction Forum, ELTIF. Let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Praveen, coordinator of the online programs of ELTIF. For almost a decade, I had been associating myself with the programs of ELTIF. Now, Ms. Vinija will introduce ELTIF and our programs. Thank you, sir. Good evening to one and all. Let me speak a few words about ELTIF, English Language Teachers Interaction Forum. ELTIF is a voluntary teacher forum working for the empowerment of teachers, learners, and any user or lover of English language. The commencement of ELTIF was in 2002 as an informal gathering of teachers of English, and it became a registered professional platform for interaction in 2010. ELTIF lives in and works mainly for the villages as its mission is empowering rural India through English language education. ELTIF has organized innumerable programs for students, teachers, and parents in various part, parts of the country, such as Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry, and Mahi. Apart from the hundreds of programs in communicative English for teachers and children, ELTIF has been involving in social activities organizing awareness programs for parents and public, support programs for housewives, uh, could, uh, and empowerment program for Kudumbasri workers and tribal women. For this forum, teaching is not just an academic activity confined to the four walls of the classroom. ELTIF moves beyond the classroom. Besides these activities, ELTIF has been regularly organizing national conferences Every year, international conferences at least once in three years in collaboration with universities and other educational institutions. Delegates from all over the country participate in them, present papers and conduct workshops and so on. Moreover, ELTIF has been publishing a professional quarterly journal of, uh, journal of ELTIF promptly and regularly for the last 10 years. ELTIF thus offers an approachable platform for anyone who loves English language, irrespective of their career or profession, to present papers in the conferences and uh, to get it published in journals as well. Now, ELTIF has ex expanded its horizon to the virtual world through this online lecture series. Thus, it provides opportunities for the teachers and learners of English to listen to the experts in the field and to get uh, and to get interact with them. I request all the participants to be a part of ELTIF and its endeavors to fulfill its mission. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the formal welcome of the resource person for the day, Professor Paul Gunasheka. It's a great honor to have you here, sir. I request uh, Dr. Kartika, faculty of NIT, introduce Professor Paul. I take this as a privilege to introduce my beloved teacher and a great academician, Professor Paul Gunashekhar. Professor Paul Gunashekhar taught English, trained teachers of English, and developed instructional materials for English language teaching for over 43 years. Educated in Bangalore and London, he was a professor in the Department of Materials Development, Testing and Evaluation at the Indian Foreign Languages University, formerly CIFL, Hyderabad. He served the university as Proctor, Dean of English Language Education, Dean of Publishing and Acting Vice Chancellor at different times. He retired from EFLU in October 2017. Professor Paul Gunashekar has authored, co-authored, and edited over 250 English teaching books, including course books, workbooks, supplementary and literature readers, teachers' books, and reading cards for different national agencies like NCRT, CBSE, NIOS, IGNO, 
and other institutions and also state agencies like the government of Andhra Pradesh, the government of Tripura, the government of Mizoram and Orissa and the Andhra Pradesh Social Welfare Residential Educational Institution Society. Co-author of Communicate in English, New Learning to Communicate for the Middle School, Provocations, a Reading Course for Colleges, and all of them are published by Oxford University Press India. In addition, he has developed audio materials for schools and video programs for colleges. Professor Gunashekar has conducted over a thousand teacher training workshops in India and abroad. And he has presented papers at conferences and symposiums in the UK, Holland, Japan, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and Nepal, other than India. He has several research publications, notably the Directory of ELT Research in India and edited the EFLU Research Journal, Languaging. He has also conducted courses in business communication, communication skills, report writing, public speaking, and presentation skills for corporate houses. Awarded the Commonwealth Scholarship for ELT Research in the UK, Professor Paul Kunashekhar specializes in materials development, course design, teacher development, and English for specific purposes. He is the advisor and Indian English consultant to the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary and the Oxford English Dictionary. It's a great privilege, sir, to welcome you to this platform to address us this evening. And over to you, sir. Thank you and welcome you once again. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure being with you on a Saturday evening. Uh, thank you very much for finding the time to uh, listen to my little presentation and um, a special hello to everybody in the audience. By that I mean so many uh, familiar faces, um, old friends, and um, a special welcome to somebody who has mentored so many of us, Professor Krishnaswamy. Right, he's there in the audience too. Uh, so thank you, sir, for being with us this evening. After discussing um, possible areas uh, for um, a presentation, an ELTIF presentation, Professor Baskaranar and I decided uh, that I should talk to you about creativity and writing and adopt a classroom perspective. And um, you must have received uh, this little summary of my uh, talk um, when you registered uh, for the webinar. Um, I'll read it out because um, I'm always a little um, unsure about who's there in the audience. If there are two or three visually challenged uh, teachers of English there. I don't want them to be left out in any sense. So um, uh, most of what I have on the slide, I will read the uh, text out. Thank you. My presentation will take a classroom perspective on creative written expression. Using written texts produced by young learners, as well as teacher trainees as points of reference, the talk will offer comments on materials suitable for promoting creativity. It will also include examples of how apparently insipid written texts can be transformed into imaginative pieces of written expression. About 30 years ago, uh, I was chatting with uh, the late Professor Shunil Kumari Ram's 10-year-old niece, grandniece, I should say, Shefali, right? Um, she was only 10 at that time. She's now a mother of two. At one point, Shefali asked me if I knew the meaning of the word miser, M-I-S-E-R. I promptly told her, uh, a miser is a person who loves money, but hates spending it. She said, that's right. Do you know what a miser did on a cold winter's night to keep himself warm? Well, he sat in front of a candle. 
I smiled and said, I see what you mean. Shafari then said, Uncle, do you know what the miser did when it became very, very, very cold? He lit the candle. I realized then that Shafali had actually told me a home truth, that even a child can offer a creative interpretation of a commonplace banal word. Bateson and Martin explain what creativity means. Creativity is about breaking away from established patterns. Creative people perceive new relations between thoughts or things or forms of expression that would normally seem utterly different. They are able to combine them into new forms, connecting the seemingly unconnected. Um, I can share the sources with you uh, later, right? Here's an example of what Bateson and Martin mean. Take a good look, uh, look at it, and uh, you can laugh if you want to. <laughs> it's good to be aware of the difference between the two, a British B and a USB. Okay, uh, so play on language here. The one area of specialized writing that we assume has a predominance of creativity is uh, literature, in particular poetry. Now take a look at these two texts. Text A. When you make a call, these are the things you need to do. First, check the code, if any, and number. Lift the receiver and listen for a dial tone, a continuous purring sound. Dial carefully and allow the dial to return freely. Then wait for another tone. You'll then hear the ringing tone, burr, burr. The number is being called, but you might end up hearing that it's engaged, which means you'll hear a repeated single note. So you try again a few minutes later. After dialing a trunk call, there'll be a pause before you hear a tone. And during this time, the trunk equipment will be connecting your call. At the end of the call, replace the receiver securely because the timing of the call stops when the caller hangs up, right? There's um, a little more, I, I haven't put it on the slide. These are all from the UK government post office uh, instructions um, put out in 1970. And if you remember, those of you who are um, senior citizens in particular, that those were the days when we had um, a different kind of gadget to make phone calls and a similar kind of uh, uh, a telephone uh, to make calls from a public phone booth. You'll then notice that the text tells you how to use a telephone. You'll notice uh, the text tells you how to use a telephone, the kind of telephone we used several decades ago, which we dialed with our index finger to make local calls and trunk calls, particularly from coin-operated telephone booths. You'll notice that the text tells you how to use a telephone, the kind of telephone we used several decades ago, which we dialed with our index finger to make local calls and trunk calls, particularly from coin-operated telephone booths. It's a prose text, an instructional prose text. As you'd expect, there are a number of imperatives in it. Check the code, lift the receiver, listen for a dial tone, dial carefully, and so on. The instructions themselves are clear and unambiguous. They mean what they say. You would not therefore want to use your skills of interpretation to look for an underlying meaning in the text. Now, look at text B, and you'll notice straight away it's so different. 
It's a poem. It's an extract from a poem. I think it, there, there are about 18 lines in the poem. And I've chosen six of them. Uh, and these six lines are very often quoted um, as examples of uh, how literature works in terms of uh, creative writing. In Holmes, a haunted apparatus sleeps that snores when you pick it up. If the ghost cries, they carry it to their lips and soothe it to sleep with sounds. And yet they wake it up deliberately by tickling with a finger. Um, famous poem, Craig Rain, British poet, uh, who uh, began a series of publications uh, all with the word Martian because he pretended he was a Martian most of the time and took a dispassionate view of uh, human civilization. And this is a poem he wrote in 1979. Now, did you notice that this particular text does not even mention the word telephone? And yet, it's evidently a description of the instrument. Now, you'll notice that the six lines are evidently a description of uh, the telephone. The description itself is a Martian perspective. An alien from Mars is trying to make sense of an earthly gadget. He or she notices the telephone and observes how it is used by human beings. Now, no human being would want to use the Martian's observations as a set of instructions for using a telephone. Given a choice, you would choose text A if you wish to operate a telephone. But if you wanted to go beyond the prosaic to deploy your faculties of imagination and skills of interpretation, you would choose text B. Text A does not tease your creative buds. So you're not likely to return to it once you've internalized the instructions. But text B has qualities that would make you return to it frequently because it affords extraordinary intellectual pleasure. In essence, text B is a poem that has typical features of literary creativity. The word creativity has generally been used by teachers of English in two distinct ways. One group of teachers feel that the English lesson, in particular the writing period, is probably the only slot in the timetable that students can use to freely express their own interests, opinions, and feelings. These teachers believe that it is a key component of language education for young people to be afforded opportunities for uninhibited expression of their thoughts and emotions. In this sense, creative self-expression becomes an important curricular aim and therefore a necessary part of materials design. However, there is another group of teachers of English who emphasize the importance of teaching students to communicate acceptably in the standard form of the written language and the need to adhere to accepted norms of written expression. These teachers accuse the creativity advocates of ignoring linguistic propriety in matters of grammar, vocabulary, spelling, and punctuation. And not unexpectedly, these accuracy diehards, if I might uh, call them that, are accused by the other group, and to use the words of Peter Wingard, of making writing an arid wasteland of rules and formal exercises, leading to boredom and alienation on the part of the pupils. Now, there are obvious risks and dangers in both these extremes. 
and not surprisingly, materials developers like me have tried to find a middle path between them. The English teacher of class eight in a school in Hyderabad once asked his students to write a few lines on their favorite fruit. Now I'll show you two of those written responses. This is the first response, my favorite fruit. This is what the student said. I like bananas the most. The banana fruit comes in different sizes, colors, and firmness. It's usually long and curved. The tasty flesh inside is covered by a skin that can be yellow, green, or red. The fruits grow in a cluster and hang from the top of the plant. India and China produce the most bananas. Everyone loves bananas, and I'm no exception, right? Um, now I'd like you to kind of mentally uh, give this piece of writing a grade, A plus A, B plus B, C, whatever, and hold on to that grade, right? You'd have noticed, just to help you, that this particular young writer has an enviable command of the norms of linguistic accuracy, right? Now, if you look at the second response um, that I stored away. My favorite fruit, another student, and this is what he said. I particularly like peeling off the skin of fruits. The fruit which I enjoy peeling the most is the banana. I love its taste, and if it's a little overripe, it melts in your mouth like chocolate. If you mash it up, ah, it's absolutely delicious. If you chop it up like long French fries, ah, it's even more tasty. Banana with a little lemon and chili powder is marvelous and absolutely irresistible. Banana and cream is all right, but plain and simple and untouched banana is uh, the best. Any thoughts? On this text, what do you think this text deserves in terms of a grade? Many of you, I'm sure, probably feel the second description is more appealing. And not surprisingly, the teacher concerned gave the second response a higher mark. And this particular teacher, who was an alumna of CIEFL, in the uh, um, 80s, late 70s and 80s, always challenged the students to be creative and bold in expressing themselves because she firmly believed that young people should find their own voices. She therefore didn't hesitate to reward freshness and spontaneity. Now these two responses, written responses, raise larger questions of syllabus options, methodological choices, and materials development. Ken Highland says that a writing curriculum can be organized around one or more of these concepts, language structures, text functions, like defining, exemplifying, classifying, comparing and contrasting, themes or topics like childhood, sports, and humor, composing processes like planning, writing, reviewing, redrafting, and editing, substantive content like science and technology, environmental awareness, and gender equality, genre and context of writing like a report, a business letter, an advertisement, and lastly, creative expression. The list, Highland's list, however, begs the question as to what the importance and scope of creativity is. At one extreme, a complete independent course in creative writing can be planned for young adults. 
as the Indira Gandhi National Open University uh, did several decades ago with the help of the late Professor Shiv K. Kumar. At the other end, prominent elements of creativity can be infused into texts that are basically banal, run-of-the-mill, dull, and predictable. So in this sense, creativity may not be a fundamental attribute in written expression, but an after and add-on. How can we enable our learners and teachers to acknowledge the significance of creative expression in a normal English classroom. Now, traditionally, the three sequential stages in the teaching of writing have been controlled writing, leading to guided writing, and then to free writing. Right? Now, let's assume that we want to teach the present simple tense to focus attention on repeated actions such as routines and habits. We could use this table that I'm going to show you as a stimulus to build a bridge between controlled writing and guided writing. The table, notice, has tabulated information about three men who play cricket for the city gym fana. Take a look at the details, please. Okay. Now, given this information, the teacher can then say, Is a passage about one of them. Right? First, in the, uh, the table. Sudarshan Bhatia is a cricketer. He plays for the city Jimkana. He's 26 years old and is married. His wife's name is Deepika and she's a nurse. He rides a motorcycle and in his spare time he reads and also listens to film music. At home, he helps with the shopping. He reads the Express, right? Uh, you can then fill the class, write a similar passage about one of the other two cricketers using the information in the table, right? So uh, if you remember the names, Arshad Khan, and uh, Ravi Rajaratnam. So this might be second response. And indeed this was in a teacher training uh, uh, session that I had some years ago. Um, Arshad Khan. Arshad Khan plays for the city Jimkana Cricket Club. He's 25 and married. His wife is Nazreen and she's an architect. Arshad rides a scooter and when he has the time, he does some gardening and cooking. After every meal, he does the washing up. He reads the Herald every day. Right? At a teacher training workshop, the one I uh, referred to earlier, at that tra training workshop, after I got the trainees to produce, as you noticed, bland texts of the kind I showed you, I said, thanks for the effort, ladies and gentlemen. Can you now do something for me? Write a creative description, I repeat, a creative description of one of the three cricketers. Let your hair down and let your imagination run riot, I said. And here's a text that one of the teachers produced. Now, before you um, look at the uh, response, take a look at the details under Ravi Rajaratnam's name, right? Ravi Rajaratnam. Okay? Right. And this was one of the responses after my appeal. 
I'm Ravi, Ravi Rajaratnam. People think I'm a full-time cricketer because my name often appears in the Chronicle sports page, but I'm not. I play cricket only on Sundays. I'm actually a bus driver for the city corporation. Six months ago, a gorgeous woman called Pankajam was posted as conductor on my bus. And it was love at first sight. After a few days of courtship, I proposed to her in our bus in full view of 40 bewildered passengers. What's more, we got married in our bus with my friends Sudarshan, Bhatia and Arshid Khan playing best men. Now that I'm 28, I'm planning to do two things. One, stop playing cricket and plunge into Carnatic music and chess. Two, get rid of my moped. The ruddy thing breaks down every time I take Pankajam billion. If only she'd stop nagging me to clean and dust our bus, sorry, our house every day. Now the lesson is obvious. With a little bit of encouragement and support, learners and teachers can be trained to perform, sorry, to transform a plain and lackluster text into an astonishing, inspired piece of writing. A word of caution though, we can deliberately break rules and subvert established conventions of language use only when we are familiar with rules and conventions of language use. Jones, in 2016, says, and I quote, language is rule governed. It's a system that allows and even exploits the creative breaking of its own rules. But we cannot break rules until we know what they are. I'll share these uh, details with you later, the sources, okay? Here are two examples of what Jones means. The first one, right? it's called the porcupine. Now I'm sure all of you know what a porcupine is, right? And how it defends itself when um, it thinks it's being attacked, right? And this is what Bodeca, a poet, a children's uh, poet wrote. Rebecca Jane, a friend of mine, went out to pat a porcupine. She very shortly came back in, disgusted with the porcupine. One never ever should, said Jane, go out and pat a porcupine. Right? Okay. Um, you notice it's all about spelling and the lesson is obvious, isn't it? Unless you know the correct spelling, the right spelling, you can't take liberties as a poet has in this case with the spelling. Here's another example, right? Take a look at this particular visual, right? It's a photographer's and Take a good look at the advertisement. We can shoot your wife and frame your mother-in-law. If you want, we can hang them too. My apologies to all women here. It's obviously a very patriarchal uh, attitude to adopt when you're a photographer, right? But you can see what uh, they're doing in this UK advertisement, can't you? Right, they're playing with uh, words, right? Uh, so it's a lexical choice that they've made, particularly with words that have more than one meaning, polysemy as we call it, right? Shoot, frame and hang, right? So it's delightful uh, when you see something like this. What mechanism does a teacher of English operate in a writing class? Generally, the stimuli for classroom writing include print materials, 
like a short story, a poem or a newspaper report, audio materials, like a song, a radio play or a lecture, visual materials, like a photograph, a picture or a cartoon, electronic materials, like the internet or a web page, and realia, like a household object which you carry into the classroom. The choice of the stimuli will depend on the proficiency level of the learners and the expected written outcomes. In Indian school and college textbooks, readings from different print genres are the main sources of stimuli for class activities. In addition to using a reading text to teach a set of subskills of reading and some relevant items of grammar and vocabulary, it is used for an instrumental purpose, which is to stimulate interest in a writing topic. The topic itself is often directly linked to the theme of the core reading text. Textbook writers use this technique because the content or thematic scaffolding is provided by the reading text or the unit, the whole unit. For example, in one of my course books for class eight, there is a whole unit on social equality comprising four texts. An extract from Mahatma Gandhi's autobiography, the one about his being thrown out of uh, a train in South Africa on 7th June, 19, sorry, 1893, because colored persons were not permitted to travel first class. That is followed by a well-known essay by A.L. Hendricks titled, Jamaican Fragment about racial equality in the West Indies. <clears throat> then the famous story on social inequality, The Thakur's Well by Premchand, and the short but powerful poem, We're All Equal by the Tamil poet Subramanya Bharati. The writing task in this unit is based on an important aspect of gender inequality. And I'll show you just the instruction, not the, uh, the whole task. The focus is on enabling uh, the class eight learners to learn a little about how to uh, put together a formal letter. And this is what it says. Increasingly, women in India have broken into professions that kept them away for decades. We now have women commandos and women space scientists, for example. Surprisingly, it's still unusual to find women chauffeurs, women bus drivers, and women auto rickshaw drivers in our towns and cities. And what's the task? Write a letter to the editor of a local newspaper sharing your concern about the prevailing prejudice against women becoming drivers in public transport vehicles. And here's a sample letter format for you to use. Uh, I'm not going to show you the format. All that we're telling the learners is, remember, the format is important, but it is based on conventions and conventions change. So don't worry too much about conventions of writing formal letters because they do keep uh, changing uh, regularly, right? Now this particular task has two functions. One, to introduce learners to the conventions of a formal letter, which Jeremy Harmer labeled a real purpose task. And two, perhaps more importantly, to get them to extrapolate from the overriding theme of social inequality in the unit to the more specific issue of prejudice against women on the work front and develop content that is personalized but sensitive. Obviously, it's possible to make learners, particularly advanced learners, to give us well-considered but individualistic responses to gender inequality and women's empowerment by using a standalone prompt 
like this, uh, uh, this particular kind of task, uh, Jeremy Hama calls an invented purpose task, as opposed to a real purpose task. Right. Take a look at this popular cartoon based on uh, the adventures of Hagar, the horrible. And in the first frame, Hagar is uh, talking to his daughter and his wife. Lucky Eddie tells me it's International Women's Day today. My so goodness. shouldn't you be cleaning up or cooking a meal in celebration? And, uh, right? And see what happened to him in the third frame. The right? Retribution. Okay. Right. The question that arises is, is it a myth? This whole thing called gender equality. Right. Okay. That's for us to think about. What can the writing teacher do to make the English class conducive to creativity? I can think of three preparatory steps she can take to make creativity the focus of learners' written expression. Right? Three steps. Step one. We should create a non-threatening, non-judgmental atmosphere where the learners are encouraged and enthused to let their hair down and not feel intimidated that their every response or expression is being scrutinized for grammatical, lexical, and spelling errors. In essence, she should focus on the message, the content, the substantive meaning of what they are trying hard to express, rather than picking on the flawed, imperfect way they may express it. If she must criticize, she should do so without causing embarrassment or anxiety. Second step, she should offer a varied, rich menu of writing tasks and consciously introduce what people call the aesthetic dimension that is manifested in art, photographs, music and song, poetry and drama, and film and video. Step three. Most importantly, she should ensure that the learners' written productions, outputs, are published, published either on the class notice board or in the school magazine. Okay, my last sample of uh, creative expression is based um, on a photograph. Now, please be nice to me and say I'm the handsomest of the three there. Okay. Now, this is a real photograph, right? Uh, taken, as you've uh, noticed there, in 2005. Now, I got a grade four student to write an imaginative description of this photograph. I won't show you, I can't show it to you on a slide, but I'm going to read it out to you. So what this young girl wrote after studying this photograph. And this is what she wrote. The orangutan's life. Way, way back many centuries ago, not long after the Bible began, in the heart of the rainforest, there was a pack of orangutans. The smallest orangutan was named Hermione. Her friends and family called her Hermy for short. Now, a few days later, a boy called Brian went for a stroll in the rainforest and came across the orangutans. Now the orangutans hid. 
Hermione, being the bravest, swung up to Brian, who instantly put her in a cage. Brian went back to his house with the cage and showed Hermy to his sister, Sister Scarlet. Now, like Brian, Scarlet loved Hermy, which on a scale of one to 100 would be 100. They took Hermy up to Brian's room and set to work building a little room for Hermy. Now, Hermy really liked her new owners and her new home. But 10 years later, Hermie got pretty homesick. So Brian and Scarlett took her back to where she really belonged. The two kids knew it would be sad, wait, no, tragic, to say goodbye to Hermie, but they did manage to. Another few years later, a real tragedy came. Scarlet died. Brian was extremely sad, but he kind of got over it. Then a few days later, Hermie came back and with a friend, Amazon, this time. Brian was overjoyed and took a selfie with them. Before slowly and sadly, he joined Scarlet in death. The end. So as you must have noticed, the writer has killed me off. And so this is the ghost addressing you now, right? I then persuaded an adult who's an education officer, but not a teacher of English, to respond to the same photograph in writing. I advised her to go beyond a mere obvious description of the photograph and develop a truly imaginative narrative comprising the three characters in the photograph. And this is what she produced. She titled it, Favorite Picture. Come and watch this program, Paul. It's this new guy, David Attenborough, doing a natural history series called out Joya, 10-year-old Paul's mom. I don't like it. I don't want to watch it called uh, call back Paul. Come on, sweetheart, just watch it once. I've heard it's good, said Joya. Okay, mumbled Paul half-heartedly. He would rather, much rather play with his He-Man collection. Life on Earth, the documentary, was just starting on television. Paul and his family, mum, dad, and little sister Ellie, all watched the program. They thoroughly enjoyed it. I didn't know what it was. He didn't know what it was. But Paul hoped. He had never seen a documentary before, let alone a documentary on natural history. The creatures in their natural surroundings fascinated him, and he thought Attenborough was a wonderful presenter. Paul and Ellie had something in common now. They would spend hours exploring their back, back garden for insects, cobwebs, plants, and nests. The family holidays were designed to take in as much nature as possible. Ellie loved fossil hunting, and Paul was spellbound by animals that could climb and live in trees, particularly sloths and orangutans. One evening had transformed these youngsters into natural historians, and this would stay with them all their life. Years went by, and Paul studied anthropology, while Ellie became an archaeologist. They still went exploring lands together whenever they had some free time. Paul, incidentally, settled down in Borneo, working with orangutans, his first love. He spent years researching and studying these fascinating creatures. One of his fondest memories is this picture with his favorite two orangutans. Ellie, who he named after his sister, best friend and fellow explorer, and Joya, 
without whose encouragement he would not have found this amazing world of natural history. Now these writing tasks and the written responses leading uh, that I've uh, read out to you or shown to you lead to five vital questions of relevance to the writing classroom. Five questions that I'm going to share with you for you to think about. Firstly, can we assume that all learners have an innate ability to be creative in writing? If some learners do indeed show promise of creative expression, how can we help them realize their full potential? Second question, if creative writing is to flourish, what tasks and topics can help learners go beyond nondescript writing to truly expressive writing? Are some writing inputs more amenable to innovative exploitation? Third question, should creativity in writing be defined by content alone? If so, can we allow learners to write in what is often referred to as a Promethean fashion, that is, in such an original and individual manner that their writing disregards accepted norms of linguistic correctness and rhetorical structure? Fourth question, are teachers who promote creative expressions persons with resourcefulness, empathy, and open-mindedness? How can teachers deal with writing that has controversial or objectionable content? Content that has willy-nilly crossed boundaries of decorum and decency. And lastly, do teacher education programs include a substantial com component that sensitizes trainees to the need for fostering creative expression, creative written expression in the language classroom? Five questions for you to think about. Let me, in conclusion, show you three visuals all related to the raging coronavirus. Obvious, isn't it? Right? Does anyone know if we can take showers yet? Or should we just keep washing our hands? Right? Slide two. Something that's happened at the airport question that the clerk asks, do you want the mask section or the no mask section? And the passenger says, no mask, and see what happens to him, right? Strapped to the wing outside the aircraft. Slide three, visual three, right? Uh, those of you who have played football, who know the game well, will notice that uh, the four players in blue are supposed to be defending the goal behind them with the goalkeeper as a necessary backup. And they're not supposed to leave gaps between them, which allows the player, the, the, uh, the player on the offensive, that is, right? to shoot right into the goal. But that's precisely what's happened. And the goalkeeper in total frustration says, hey, Sesko Kama, so what the hell have you done, right? Why did you leave a gap between yourselves? And one of them says, social distance, social distancing, right? Okay, keep the three visuals in mind. And here's home assignment for you all to do, right? When you have done this assignment, send them across to Professor Bhaskar and Naya, right? For his uh, assessment and feedback. 
right? As the assessment, sorry, the instructions. Use the three visuals to write a column for a national newspaper on ensuring personal hygiene, wearing a mask in all public places, and maintaining social distance. And give your piece of writing the title, Stay Safe. Note, e.g., the editor will not publish it if it is not infused with imagination and novel suggestions. And the best text will be sent to Donald Trump. Right. Okay, before I sign off, here's a quotation that I couldn't resist sharing with you. Creativity is not simply an optional add-on to what we do, but is its very essence. And this is from Meili and Is, right? Most of you in the audience, I'm sure, are familiar with Alan Meili's work, right? And Thomas Kiss, an um, emerging um, specialist, ELT specialist and applied linguist who used to work in Singapore, right? Now I think he's moved uh, to the UK. And this is a book I would strongly recommend that you uh, obtain, right? And I think with a little bit of help from uh, um, the um, EFLU, um, ELE forum in particular, I think Sharoon, I'll, I'll talk to her if this particular book can be made available in a soft version so that you can download it or at least read it, right? So thank you very much. Uh, now uh, we'll have a question answer session. Uh, Dr. Kartika had been following the chat box. Well, there is a question for you. Yes. Uh, how can we focus more on content and less in lang less on language in the classroom? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, but as I hinted at the very beginning, I want to play it safe, right? I can't possibly argue that uh, we must have the greatest content, um, but, you know, clothed in a very poor language. What we ought to be looking for is a balance, right? And this, I think, will take you to uh, one of the basic principles of process writing, right? Um, in process writing, if you remember the stages, when you begin writing about uh, a topic, you just write as the ideas flow, right? They may not be structured. They may not even be in uh, good English, but you need to begin there, right? So if we can encourage our learners, at least in the early stages of producing a draft, and that word draft is very important, maybe the, uh, the focus will be entirely on the content of the uh, output. Having uh, looked at it as a teacher, and I'm hoping you'll be able to uh, interact with each student, and that's the whole business of process writing, really, um, and their output, their writing. You should be able to say great ideas, uh, but you want to take a look at the the grammar, for instance, um, Ellie, right, Kartika, right, whoever the student might be. Um, choose your uh, uh, words um, a little more carefully. Maybe you need to uh, get your spellings right. Uh, and uh, a couple of punctuation errors, perhaps. Um, so take a look at it. So you gently encourage them to shift their attention to the linguistic elements of writing. But I think you need to begin with content, right? So if that becomes a general tradition in the classrooms, first think about what you want to write. Um, I think it'll work, right? 
because I think most of us are tempted to focus basically on uh, uh, content uh, and uh, neglect. Um, sorry, I'm looking for uh, a possible uh, example. I can find it, right? Um, I neglect. I can uh, read this out to you. Uh, it'll take me a while if I have to get back to showing you the uh, visual. Um, and I can read it out to you uh, because Lothika, my wife, is not around. She's just answered the doorbell, right? And um, my wife sent me a text. And the text said, you're great. You're spelled Y-O-U-R. You're great. So naturally, as an English teacher, I wrote back, no, you're great. Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, great. She's been walking around today all happy and smiling. Now, should I tell her I was just correcting her grammar or let it go in uh, the name of marital peace? Right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Okay, sir. There are two more, uh, three more questions. Yeah. Uh, two of them closely related. Uh, okay. how, how does <clears throat> the average English teacher negotiate the need to teach students more formal academic writing and creative writing among students? And then the second, I mean, the third question is also somewhere related. In rural schools, is it really possible to think of creative writing in English where the real challenge is the teaching of the English language itself? I agree. I agree. I think um, uh, I entirely share the concern um, that goes with the, the two uh, questions. Um, the second one, in a sense, I think uh, uh, your LTIF has been trying to take care of it, right? Um, if you want children to be creative and not be inhibited by the language, there is no harm in getting them to express themselves in the local language, their mother tongue, right? Assuming, of course, that the uh, mother tongue and the, uh, is, is familiar to the teacher, right? So I'm looking at a situation in Kerala, for instance, where you would expect most of the students to be Malayalam speakers and the teacher also to be a Malayalam speaker. And maybe given that uh, confidence that they can write freely and extremely interesting stuff that the teacher likes, approves of and applauds, they can then be persuaded to move to not translating, but transcreating whatever they put in Malayalam into English, right? Uh, obviously, there will be flaws and errors uh, galore. Um, why shouldn't there be? They're learners, right? And particularly in the context in which ELTIF uh, volunteers are working, uh, they're uh, you know, actually studying in terribly deprived circumstances. So, we should be happy with what we get in terms of an output in English from each one of them. Uh, and over a period of time, I think they will get better and better, which is how lots of us actually got better. Um, not necessarily me, but I know of a whole lot of colleagues and friends who uh, studied in uh, um, mother tongue medium schools, regional medium schools, began to learn English much, much later in, uh, uh, in uh, school. Some of them learned English, uh, started learning English in class eight, and eventually went on to doing a PhD in English and joining um, the faculty of CIEFL, right? So there've been any number of successes of that kind. So we shouldn't worry too much about the fact that uh, they're not able to express themselves in English. Little pieces of writing is fine, but the academic bit writing, unfortunately, is something we are all stuck with in the sense that all writing curriculums 
and uh, board exams uh, uh, at classes 10 and 12 require uh, familiarity with um, different kinds of lit uh, writing genres, right? And uh, the commonest, of course, is uh, um, you know, writing a formal letter uh, with some guidance thrown in. It could be a letter of thanks, it could be a letter of complaint, right, uh, whatever. Um, so uh, when that happens, you end up being restricted in a sense with what you want to put into the text. Um, the content in a sense takes care of itself. But teachers, I think, will worry a little more, I've noticed that over the years, about the format, for instance, conventions of, let's say, formal letter writing. Right? And um, my um, uh, response when this kind of question comes up is to always remind them that when somebody writes to you, right, whether it's formal or an informal letter, you don't start off by studying the format whether lines are indented, whether everything is being uh, you know, punctuated, et cetera. You take in what the message is first. And then maybe you can uh, you know, put your English teacher's hat on and worry about uh, the conventions uh, that the person hasn't scrupulously followed, right? But you can't allow conventions to overwhelm you. Uh, because that can happen to uh, lots of our English teachers themselves, the young ones in the audience, who probably not yet married, to uh, getting letters, uh, love letters from their uh, uh, romantic ones uh, uh, from another town or city or a country, we don't know, right? It would be very unfair to that person abroad or in a different state for you to pick up your red pen and uh, mark it up with corrections and send it back saying, Please rewrite this and send the letter uh, in, uh, in accepted language, right? So conventions matter, as I hinted uh, earlier in my own little presentation, but not to the extent of uh, interfering with what you want to say. The what will always dominate the how, right? particularly in creative writing, right? Okay, sorry, yes. Sir, uh, shall we take uh, one more last question? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, sure. Sir, it's like, uh, can creativity be a part of ESP writing classroom? Mm -hmm. And there is another question from another person, uh, which is, is there a need to differentiate writing as creative? Isn't there creativity in every kind of writing that we do? Ah, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, frankly, I haven't thought about creativity in an ESP context, right? Because generally speaking, in ESP, we are training our adult learners, college learners, uh, learners particularly of science and technology, and business administration, law, etc., <clears throat> to conform to accepted norms of uh, their own register, right? Uh, of course, you can play with language, but you're taking a risk, right? Um, I, I still remember uh, what happened uh, to a, a classmate of mine um, in college. Um, his name is Kath Hatif, Hatif Kazwini. I lost touch with him. Brilliant uh, writer of English, right? Uh, way beyond any of us in the class and a creative writer. And as long as he was in uh, school, senior Cambridge, et cetera, with me, no problems. We had teachers who could appreciate, um, you know, how easily he subverted uh, conventions, uh, but they actually encouraged him to carry on doing this. But in the college first semester examination, in a formal letter uh, context, he let his hair down and God knows what he wrote, but I can imagine um, what the creative output must have been and actually ended up failing his English paper, right? And I still remember how depressed he was. Um, so 
colleges expect colleges of uh, you know specialist um, areas expect you to fall in line right um, that that's the way life is this is the way uh, emails are shot off this is the way reports are presented etc but if you work in a relatively freer uh, atmosphere and i've been told in uh, an organization like uh, microsoft um, and google and uh, oracle uh, too uh, there are several bosses who actually welcome um, this break away uh, from uh, established conventions um, but i i'm not sure i would recommend that at the teaching stage right our job uh, as teachers of science and technology etc is to get our learners familiar with the kind of register they're going to end up specializing in themselves working in those registers uh, as uh, you know for their livelihood right you all can answer those questions it doesn't have to be me all the time <laughs> okay uh, so yes. how can we evaluate the creativity writing of the massive classes of college students i think ah, large classes i know i know this college. i was wondering when you would bring up uh, I know. Uh, assessment uh, my simple answer would be don't try to assess everything that your students produce uh, let me put that into context if you have 50 or 60 students in your class and you yourself have fallen into the tradition of uh, uh, taking away all those 50 assignments back to your staff room and i suspect most of the time uh, you take them back home because you can't find the time uh, um, in college and you then spend a whole evening or a whole night sometimes uh, grading those papers marking those papers right now essentially what this means is you mark the paper and you hand back your uh, um, feedback to the students uh, the next day written feedback and yes students love it because they uh, appreciate the fact um so uh, learners come to expect you to read what you have written what they have written for you very carefully and comment on them uh, so that your writing becomes better but tragically what happens is because as a teacher and as a system some school systems in particular insist on this you want to or you're obliged to assess mark grade every piece of writing that your learners your class produces you end up giving them fewer and fewer assignments so the net result is you give them very little practice in writing simply because you cannot handle the output the quantum of output um every week or every two weeks right so good teachers and this is what we have done as uh, trainers in uh, several contexts we encourage our teachers to give a a writing task maybe once a week right but you make it clear to the students and in the case of uh, school students you tell the parents very clearly that you will actually use your red pen only one time out of every four uh, rounds of written expression right uh, and you can tell them the other three rounds of uh, writing they do for me i'm going to read them obviously very carefully but you'll only see my initials at the end of the text it doesn't mean i haven't read them that i don't have ideas about uh, how to help them get better it's just that this is the way i operate so if that becomes a culture students will want to write for you right so um, the more they write the better they will become this is true of all of us isn't it i mean um, if we manage to do a fair amount of writing in our own careers it's because of the the practice uh, we've had writing and as creative writers will tell you and um, 
Kushwan Singh, I remember saying this um, in a question answer session live in Delhi, that um, he would wake up at five in the morning uh, and by six, he would be ready to uh, sit down and write at his table. And uh, six to nine, no matter what, he would force himself to write whatever. He says it didn't matter whether it was going to be published or even look worth publishing, but it's a kind of discipline I had to adopt, right? So, um, and Kushwan Singh said, that's the only way I became a writer. I made it a point to make writing a full-time job. And that's what good writers do, right? Uh, great writers have done. So I take this opportunity to thank you, sir, for being with us and delivering such an excellent session, which actually made us think, and you have given us a homework to do, which I hope all of us would do. And it was great listening to you again. And I'm sure uh, all of uh, us who were your students would cherish this uh, forever. And it was a very informative session. I do have been asking a lot of questions myself after I listened to you. Thank you very much for such an enlightening one, sir. Thank you. And thank you. over to you, Praveen, sir. I now request Dr. Lena formally thank the participants of this session. She's a member of ELTIF. Dr. Lena. Uh, warm, cheerful good evening, everyone. Uh, I think uh, I have to genuinely record our gratitude to Dr. P. Bhaskaran Nair, the president of LTIF, for being the driving force for all uh, LTIF programs, including online lecture series. Uh, words are not enough to acknowledge our gratitude to you, sir. Uh, your passion for English language teaching and your love and affection for ELT professionals and your valuable uh, support and uh, guidance enrich us and help us grow and empower in this field. Uh, I must mention our deep sense of uh, appreciation for Dr. Praveen, the uh, coordinator of online lecture series, uh, who is always in the forefront, putting all his uh, efforts to make online lectures into a reality. Uh, he works day and night, uh, do all the arrangements, checks all the technical aspects and makes everything perfect and ready. I extend a bouquet of thanks to you, sir. And even like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels uh, start rolling weeks ago. It requires planning and uh, bird's eye for details. Uh, we have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated committee members of LTIF. Uh, I record my thanks to Dr. Srihari, uh, Dr. Kartiga, Dr. Dhanya Bhaskaran, Major Anish Gurudas, Mrs. Venija, and uh, Mr. Mohanan for, whole, for their wholehearted support and cooperation. Uh, let me express my hearty thanks to all the participants for your perfect support and genuine interest in participating in our LTIF program. We look forward to you for the wholehearted cooperation in our future programs. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, may I request Dr. Vasklan Nair to formally thank uh, Professor Paul once again. In fact, Professor Paul happens to be the guru of all of us and even of Vasklan, sir. Uh, 1979, uh, that was uh, 41 years ago. Uh, I got a teacher, maybe a little younger to me, <laughs> and that was uh, Paul Gunasekhar. 41 years, uh, teacher-student relationship, as friends, in all ways, uh, Paul has been a, a great source of inspiration to me. Just one point. Maybe following the tradition of uh, teaching, learning Sanskrit in India, in the so-called aristocratic way, perhaps, English to uh, always banished humor from the classroom. Two teachers at CFL taught us how to give uh, 
the French, how to give humor uh, a seat on the French bench in the English classes. Professor Shashi Kumar and Professor Paul Gunasekhar. How today he was talking about creativity and one source of major source of uh, say admitting creativity not only in writing but in say the whole class and even outside the class would be permitting humor as he demonstrated throughout his lecture uh, permitting humor to be present in the classroom uh, creativity will naturally uh, come and stay and continue to stay uh, thank you uh, professor paul for this blessings thank you very much thank, thank, you. You, thank you so much thanks to all of you